NCAA Basketball Championship. It is time to announce this year's 64 big winners who've been selected to go to the NCAA tournament. Folks, a star-studded crowd has gathered, and among the early arrivals is Barbara, and there's Nell, Jody Foster. The showbiz celebs are here to see the real stars, like Carolina, Stackhouse, and Wallace. Rick Pitino, will Kentucky be a number one seed in the Southeast? Bob Knight and the Hoosiers sitting on the bubble. Hi, Joe Beth. Hello, Ann. And the number one seed, Forrest Gump. Michigan State's Judd Heathcote with a Judd thud. Hey, Uncle Bilty telling us how he'll fill out his brackets. Let's see who we have here. Oh, my goodness, it's Jim Phelan about St. Mary's. Yes, there he is. And, well, that made Clint Eastwood's day. Excitement in the air. A lot of questions to be answered. Like, where will the Yukon Huskies be headed? Who's number one? We don't know, but we do know who's number 64. Look at him. That's Florida International's Bob Weltlet. Hi, Bob. Hey, I think that that's funny man Robin Williams. Georgetown's John Thompson, is he throwing in the towel? Everybody's here. There's excitement in the air, so let's go backstage to last year's big winner, Arkansas's Dolan Richardson. Hey, it's NCAA tournament time. If you don't think you can win it, then you shouldn't be in it. Let's go to work. Well, we're still here. We've saved the best for last. And how exciting is this? Uh, are you excited? You got to win it, baby. Got to have it, baby. Ready this to play, is time coach? to go. Hey, clear! the floors are cleared. The big dance is going to start. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show. Coming up later, live exclusive coverage of the official first announcement of the tournament pairings for this year's 64-team men's field. We'll also take a look at some of the special pressure on a team that many feel will get a number one seed. That's UCLA in the West. And we'll be joined by, among others, head coach Jim Calhoun of Connecticut, whose team enjoyed a number one ranking this season, and Mike Jarvis of George Washington, whose Colonials are sitting on the bubble. But first, though, let's go right out to Kansas City and Andrea Joyce. Well, Pat, the debates have been raging all weekend long. Debates about selection, seating, and bubble teams. Probably at this point, the only thing we can all agree on is the fact that this is an incredibly complicated process. We do, however, have one last set of statistics for your consideration. Let's call it the nitty-gritty on the selection committee. Now, allowing for meal breaks and a couple of hours of sleep, the committee met for about 35 hours this weekend in considering 85 teams for this year's field. The committee sifted through mountains of statistics, roughly 100 pounds of paper, and whenever they reached a stalemate, they would go across the hall and take an ice cream break. So the final room service tally, well, that's probably one stat the NCAA would rather not disclose. We can tell you, though, that they did go through about 160 scoops of ice cream, so these guys have uh, some other work to take care of once they leave Kansas City. We will be back shortly with all of the important information, but right now, let's send you back to New York and Pat O'Brien. And there was so much security there, but I'm told they were all unarmed, so <laughs> nobody could be hurt now. You've been through this as a player. What's going through the players' minds right now? Well, those are, the, are sitting home waiting. There's a lot of anticipation. You want to just get started. I mean, even those that, that have lost today are just eager to get going on this team, trying to figure out where we go, what do we got to do from practice, looking for what the next thing to do as you prepare to go down the road. And the coach's standpoint? I think from a coach's standpoint, you've got to be concerned about the site. Number one, you've got to be concerned about time change, particularly if you're going west to east. Number two, altitude. Number three, travel difficulty for the team and the fans. Well, speaking of altitude, a lot of teams are sky high today. A wild day in college basketball. Let's get everybody up to date again. What a season for Wake Forest. They beat North Carolina 82-80 to in overtime. This was a wild game, and Dean Smith earned his money today. Rashid Wallace up with a little jumper there, but comes down on that right ankle, Quinn, and he's in immediate pain. Yeah, he's in excruciating pain. And you know, this is a young player who probably hadn't been hurt very often. So when he goes down like that, he gets hurt. But there's Jerry Stackhouse with the three. With the big three. And Randolph Childress had a big day. Uh, he had 37 points, including nine three-pointers. And Wake Forest goes on to win their first regular season championship since 1962. And somebody 
named Billy Packer played for that team. They win 82 to 80, a great game there in the Big West uh, Conference Championship, Nevada. Long Beach State 76 to 69 was the final there. Over in the Big Ten, Michigan and Purdue, Purdue all over them today, 73 to 67 uh, was the final score there. Indiana and Iowa 110 to 79 on Senior Day today, and uh, after the game, Bobby Knight. Uh, uh, well, here's part of the game first. Alan Henderson uh, gets the ball out on the break and gets gets the block, runs the court, gets it back there for the bucket. And then how much do you love Brian Evans? Well, you got to like him, but one of the things he's been able to do is give him some leadership, but his real ability is to drill the three. If you don't guard him, he can shoot it with range. Boom! There it is. As we said, it was senior day there, and uh, after the game, they got all the seniors from the team cheerleaders and the band, and here's what Bobby Knight said about his son. It wasn't easy for Patrick to come to Indiana. This has not been an easy situation for him. Patrick Knight is my all-time favorite Indiana player. A touching, great moment there at Indiana. Moving on in the scores, Villanova and Kentucky. Villanova is the Big East champion, 94-78 over Connecticut. Big A Conference Championship, Iowa State and Oklahoma State. Bryant Reeves too much today, 62-53 to for Oklahoma State. Kentucky beat Arkansas, 95-93, to and Louisville beat Southern Mississippi, 95-78-64 uh, uh, to in that final. We come back here, the story of UCLA, which hasn't entered the tournament ranked number one in the country since 1975. That was the last year they won it all under John Wooden. We'll show you what it took to finally wake the sleeping Bruins when the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show rolls on from coast to coast right here on CBS. Stay with us. Because We've asked the Quinn and George to give us their teams of who can win it all. This is on videotape now, so go ahead, guys. Start your engines. Well, you, Arkansas, I mean, I just think, you know, what they are defending champions, and I think they've been out of the line like uh, Connecticut, a difficult team to play. They play a variety of defenses. They're Excellent up-tempo team. Kansas and uh, Kentucky and then Massachusetts, folks. We're talking about teams that we think could win this whole thing uh, when we end uh, in early April here. Maryland and North Carolina. Well, I think North Carolina has to deal with whether or not Rasheed Wallace gets healthy. If they're healthy, then they're pretty good. But I have to say this. You've got to talk about UCLA. I don't know how you cut it because they have, they're one team that's been ranked number one that few people talk about. They will play hard. But I, Wake Forest is the team I like because I like the fact that Childress can help them make plays down the stretch. And Wake Forest, we've been talking about all day. And for goodness sakes, don't overlook Tim Duncan. A shot blocker, deluxe rebounder, low ego level. He just comes to work every day, punches in, does his job and goes home and keeps his mouth shut. And we'll begin to prove all of us wrong on Thursday at <laughs> noon Eastern time with our first round quadruple header. First tip is at 12.15, prime time action at 7.30, and we'll repeat the drill at four different first round sites on Friday. When we come back here, we'll talk live with two men who are just itching to know where they'll be on Thursday and Friday. Head coaches Jim Calhoun of Connecticut and Mike Jarvis of George Washington as Selection Sunday continues on CBS. 20 Big East games, we won 17 of them. We were, we were 25 and 4 with a team that I think was picked, uh, you know, high at fourth early in the season, yet has maximized itself. We are a very, very good team in the open court. We're a team, I think, that could get on a roll and really win. We've won 25 basketball games, fellas. Put the curtain down. New season begins, and it really has begun for us. Our kids are waiting back there, watching, waiting, waiting and watching for the bracket show, and we're really going to begin a new season. Our schedule comes out in about 10 minutes. Coach, uh, who, who don't you want to see in your brackets? <laughs> well, no Big East teams. Side. No Big East teams. Get them out of here. <laughs> no John, no Steve Lapis. No. I, I think it's good. we'd like to get a change and get away from the Big East a little bit like everybody else. You know, stop playing folks three times, it's difficult. But, but, but there's a lot of good teams out there. I mean, Arkansas, you really don't want to see. Right. You know, you don't want to see Arkansas. Uh, I, I think that, that if Rasheed Wallace all right, you still don't want to see Carolina in tournament play. This is Kansas, uh, you know, after Kemper, I don't know if I ever want to see Roy Williams again. <laughs> so there, there are particular points that you don't want to see. But quite frankly, this is a new season. I think what Mike said, it's a 95-96. There are no freshmen. Everybody now is in a different kind of season. I think we're excited about it. We're just looking to see, once again, when they give our new schedule out. Uh, Coach Jarvis, George Raveling, assuming hey, that you receive an NCAA uh, bid, what would concern you most about your team's performance as you enter the tournament? Well, to be very honest with you, uh, if we get a bid, the one thing I know about our team, and I think history has already proven, that uh, with a little bit of rest, and we've had a little bit of rest, uh, we'll be ready to play. And, uh, you know, we've done very, very well in the NCAA tournament. And I, re I really feel that if we get in, uh, we will once again uh, do a very, very credible job. 
Coach, uh, in the event that you don't get in, what would you say to your team who's sitting right there with you? Well, I would tell them, if you had, why the heck didn't you win one or two more basketball <laughs> games? You can beat them up right there. <laughs> you know, that's why they're here. Uh, to be honest with you, you know, they put me in this mess, okay? So we're in this thing together, and no matter what happens, we're going to grow and we're going to learn from it. And uh, we'll, you know, hopefully we'll be playing some basketball uh, somewhere uh, this coming week. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thank your team for joining us. And Jim, I tried to get these two guys to come out running with us in the morning, but they, they couldn't make the call. By the way, George, I like your tie. <laughs> I wonder when you guys have been shopping together. <laughs> All right, thank you both, and uh, good luck uh, down the road. We'll be back with more after this. Stay with us. <laughs> All right, coaches, players, fans, it's time. Welcome back to the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show on CBS. We have now reached the moment everyone has been waiting for, the live announcement of this year's tournament pairing. So, without further ado, let's go out to Kansas City and our Andrea Joyce. Andrea? All right, Jim, we know there are a lot of anxious people out there, so we will get right down to business. First of all, let's look at the number one seeds in the four regions. This is how they'll match up at the Final Four with East meeting West. It's Wake Forest playing its way to the top seed in the East. UCLA, the number one seed in the West. Kansas holds on to the number one seed in the Midwest. And Kentucky locks up the top seed in the Southeast. Now, we'll begin the brackets in the East region. These are Thursday-Saturday games played in Baltimore, Maryland. Maryland. The top seed Wake Forest with Mr. Clutch Randolph Childress. He came through again today with the winning shot in the ACC championship game. They will face the Aggies of North Carolina A&T. Clem Haskins Golden Gophers of Minnesota. They're the number eight seed. They will take on St. Louis. The Billikens, the little team that could, they get into the tournament without a single starter over 6-6. The number five seed is Alabama. The Crimson Tide will face Penn. The Quakers with a third straight perfect season in the Ivy League league 43 consecutive conference wins the number four seed is oklahoma state a great birthday for eddie sutton a tournament bid and a big eight title today to go with it and they will take on the dragons of drexel the north atlantic champions taking a look now at the friday sunday games in albany new york tulsa the number six seed Beware of the Golden Hurricane. They knocked UCLA out in the first round last year, made it all the way to the Sweet 16. They will take on Lou Henson's Fighting Illini. The number three seed is Villanova, one of the hottest teams in the country. They won the Big East tournament title today, and the Wildcats will take on the Monarchs of Old Dominion, representing the Colonial Conference. UNC Charlotte is the number seven seed. The 49ers will face Stanford. The Cardinal hasn't won an NCAA tournament game since 1942, the year they won the national championship. UMass, the number two seed, another great season for the Minutemen, winners of the Atlantic 10 regular season title and the tournament for the fourth consecutive year. They will hook up with the Peacocks of St. Peter's, the Peacocks representing the Metro Atlantic. Turning our attention now to the West, these are Thursday-Saturday games in Salt Lake City, Utah. Oregon, the number six seed, the Ducks return to the tournament for the first time since 1961. They will face Texas. Tom Pender's Longhorns won the Southwest Conference Tournament yesterday. Maryland, the number three seed. They're on board with Player of the Year candidate Joe Smith. And the Terps will face Gonzaga, the first NCAA tournament trip for John Stockton's alma mater. Cincinnati is the number seven seed. The Bearcats are set to meet the Temple Owls. John Cheney's squad in for the 11th time in 13 years. UConn, the number two seed out west. Great season for the Huskies. They started 15-0 and had a number one ranking for the first time in school history. And they will meet the moccasins of Tennessee Chattanooga, third straight appearance for Mac McCarthy's squad. Here are your Friday-Sunday games in Boise, Idaho. The number one seed UCLA. Are the Bruins ready? Well, they've had a picture of the Kingdom hanging in their locker room all season long. And they are set to face Florida International with a record of 11 and 18. The Golden Panthers are the losingest team in the tournament since 1961. The number eight seed is Missouri. The Tigers have been in a slump lately, losing five of their last six games. They will face Bobby Knight's Indiana Hoosiers, the eight nine game in the West. Mississippi State is the number five seed, one of the surprise teams of the season. The Bulldogs will face Santa Clara. The Broncos are off the bubble. Utah, the number four seed. The Utes with 14 wins last year, 27 
this year, and they will take on the Big West champions, Long Beach State. They won with an overtime victory today. Well, that is half the field. We will be back with the remaining 32 teams right after a short break. Everyone, get your pencils ready. We've got the other half of this year's tournament field, the Midwest region. These are Thursday, Saturday games in Dayton, Ohio. The top seed, Kansas. If the Jayhawks make it to the regionals, they'll have the good fortune of playing in nearby Kemper Arena. They will take on Colgate. The Red Raiders in for the first time in their 95-year history of playing basketball. Western Kentucky, the number eight seed, the Hilltoppers have won 24 of their last 25 games. They will take on the Michigan Wolverines, the Fab Five now down to the Fab Two. The number five seed is Arizona. Damon Stoudemire and Ben Davis, their availability is still uncertain. Arizona to petition the NCAA tomorrow. The Wildcats will take on Miami of Ohio. The Redskins coached by Herb Sendek, former Rick Pitino assistant. The number four seed is Virginia. The Cavs with their best season since the Ralph Sampson days of the early 80s. And they will face Nichols State, making their first ever tournament appearance. Moving on now to Friday, Sunday games in Austin, Texas. Memphis is the number six seed. Great progress for Larry Finch's Tigers. A nine game improvement over last year's record. They will take on Louisville. Denny Crum's team played its way in by winning the Metro Conference tournament this afternoon. The number three seed in the Midwest is Purdue. The big dog is gone, but the Boilermakers haven't missed a beat. They've won nine in a row and they are set to take on Wisconsin Green Bay this is a team that stunned Jason Kidd and Cal last year in the first round. Syracuse, the number seven seed. The Orangemen struggled down the stretch, losing seven of their last ten. And they will face Southern Illinois, the Salukis, the representative from the Missouri Valley Conference. The number two seed is Arkansas, the defending national champions, playing better and better down the stretch, winning ten of their last eleven games. They are set to take on the winner of the SWAC championship, the winner of tonight's game, Texas Southern or Mississippi Valley State. And finally, the Southeast region. These are Thursday, Saturday games in Memphis, Tennessee. The top seed, Kentucky. 36 overall appearances in the tournament for the Wildcats. That's an NCAA record, and they will face Mount St. Mary's coach Jim Phelan. 41 years of coaching. He's the second winningest active coach in the nation behind Dean Smith. BYU, Roger Reed's squad is the number eight seed in the Southeast. They will face Tulane, third trip in four years for Perry Clark and the Green Wave. The number five seed is Arizona State. Bill Frieder picked up his 300th career coaching victory against Arizona yesterday afternoon. They will face Ball State. Look for a top ten list on the Cardinals. Ball State is David Letterman's alma mater. The number four seed is Oklahoma. First year coach Kelvin Sampson and the Sooners surprised some folks this year. They will take on Manhattan. The Jaspers get an at-large bid. It's the first time in the history of the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference that the NCAA has invited two of its teams. Now, the Friday-Sunday games in Tallahassee, Florida. Georgetown gets the number six seed. Congratulations to freshman sensation Allen Iverson, the Big East Rookie of the Year. They will face what we consider to be a bubble team this afternoon, the Musketeers of Xavier. Michigan State is the number three seed. The Spartans hoping to extend the Judd Heathcote farewell tour for a few more weeks. They will face Weber State. The Big Sky champions have won 11 of their last 12 games. Iowa State, the number seven seed and they had big eight tournament wins this week over Missouri and Kansas, and that helped their cause quite a bit. They will take on Florida. Last year's Final Four team was one of this year's big bubble teams. The number two seed, North Carolina. Dean Smith has his Tar Heels in for a 21st consecutive year, and they are set to face the racers of Murray State. Re racers coach Scott Edgar started 6 a.m. practices a couple of weeks ago, and they haven't lost since. Well, that is it. The 64-team field. Never enough spots to go around for everyone. Here's a look at some of the bubble teams that uh, did not find a way in. Some of the ones that stand out. Georgia Tech, second year on the bubble, second year in a row they don't get in. Iowa lost to Indiana today. George Washington, two wins over UMass, but no bid. And in a couple of moments, we will have a conversation with Bob Frederick, the chairman of the Tournament Selection Committee. But right now, let's send you back to New York and Jim Nance.
All right, Andrea, we'll have some questions for sure. So one more time, the number one seeds in this year's tournament, Wake Forest in the East by virtue of that overtime victory against North Carolina in the ACC final this afternoon. UCLA as expected out west, Kentucky in the southeast, and Kansas in the Midwest. And here's how they match up for Seattle April 1st and 3rd, Midwest and Southeast on the same side, and the East and the West on the same side of their bracket. And conference breakdown, the Big Ten and what was really called a down year in that conference gets six to lead the way. Five out of the Big Eight, SEC with five, five out of the Pac-10, only four from the ACC as Georgia Tech does not get in, and four, as expected, from the Big East. Now, as far as reactions, a moment ago, Coach uh, Rick Majerus and the running Utes of Utah finding out that they're heading up I-15 to Boise and a first-round matchup against uh, Long Beach State. But the flip side of it all, look at George Washington and Coach uh, Mike Jarvis left out of the field of 64, and uh, let's go there right now. Mike Jarvis, I want to ask you, you're a team that uh, beat UMass twice, you beat Syracuse, you beat Memphis, you beat Temple, all teams in the field. Manhattan didn't even play a team in the top 50 in the power ratings. How do you feel about being left out and other teams like Manhattan in? Well, first of all, um, as, I, as I said earlier, if we had won uh, one or two more games, uh, especially late in the season, we would not have been left out. And, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the selection committee uh, gave a, a, a relatively unknown program by the name of George Washington an opportunity. And we went to the Sweet 16. Who's to say that maybe Manhattan with a chance won't go? And uh, the selection committee, once again, has done a great job. And uh, there's a, I mean, I, I, I congratulate teams like Xavier and uh, Manhattan. And uh, they, deserve, they deserve the opportunity. We will be back. And... Uh, We'll be in next year. That's a promise. A very, a very noble uh, reaction there, Mike Jarvis, and uh, good luck to your team. A very classy way of handling uh, that situation as George Washington is not on the field this year. Mike, best of luck. You said your season for 95-96 starts now. Good luck in the NIT, and we'll hope to see you back in the field next year. Now, Thank you. Now, when we come back, we'll hear from Bob Frederick, the chair of this year's committee. Plus, we'll also be going right through the brackets one more time with our panel of experts. So stay, stay with us as we continue right here on the Road to the Final Four. We're going to get to you in a minute, okay? I flipped and even lost in the question. <laughs> it's coming up. It's coming up, I promise. We'll go through the brackets, too, in just a moment. But first, let's go back to Kansas City and Andrea Joyce. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, I feel a lot safer in Kansas City than sitting in that studio with you guys. Uh, Bob Frederick is here with us now, the chairman of the Tournament Selection Committee. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Midwest region. Despite losing yesterday, Kansas holds on to the top seed, and yet it almost seems like that region is stacked. Was that a way to equalize the region? I don't think so, Andrea, but I'm really glad you asked about the Midwest Regional and about Kansas's presence there. Uh, yesterday, after Kansas lost to Iowa State, um, the committee spent, at my request, 30 minutes talking about Kansas's situation as far as seed is concerned. And then this morning, um, CM Newton from Kentucky and I left the room for an hour and 15 minutes while the remainder of the committee, headed by Jake Krauthammel, talked about the seating situation in regard to Kansas, K Kentucky, and some of the others that were up there at the top. When we returned from doing this show uh, during the halftime of the game this morning, uh, Jake called CM and, and I together and explained to us what the options were and where Kansas might end up and Kentucky might end up. All right. Well, uh, certainly an interesting day. We're going to uh, send it to New York now. And uh, all those guys in the studio I know have zillions of questions. Jim Nance? Uh, yeah, I'll have the first one for Bob. Uh, Bob, I have a, a question for you about George Washington and Georgia Tech. We're still abuzz about the way Mike Jarvis handled that situation so graciously, not getting the bid today. But what left uh, George Washington out of your field and also Georgia Tech with four of the top 12 teams in the country out of the ACC, and you didn't go five deep in that conference. So how about those two schools? Right. Well, Georgia Tech uh, had a losing record, uh, Jim, against the top 100. They were 8-12 and 12 against the top 100 and 10-12 and, uh, and 12 against the top 150. Sure. And uh, they lost in the uh, first round of the ACC tournament, and we thought that uh, they were not one of the 35 best at-large teams. And in the case of uh, George Washington, obviously... They had a couple of uh, really good quality wins against University of Massachusetts, but they also had some uh, unfortunate losses. And uh, their record against 50 through 150, which is where a lot of the teams in that particular cluster of teams uh, played, um, was um, five and six. 
and that was not nearly as good as a number of other teams who made the field uh, versus teams 51 through 150. Bob, this is George Raveling. A natural question being asked by college basketball fans all over America right now is, based on the Big Ten's seventh ranking as a power conference, what was the justification for six teams? George, uh, we looked uh, very closely at the Big Ten teams, and uh, we thought that um, they had six teams that were really strong teams. And you got to remember what our committee's responsibility is, and that's simply um, to choose the 35 best at-large teams in our opinion. We have no limit about number of teams from a conference. Uh, we have no uh, limit uh, about conference record. We simply have to look at all the factors that are available to us, and in our opinion, there were six teams from the Big Ten that fit into that mix. Uh, this, you may have answered my question, but I, I'm just curious. I look at Texas and Texas Tech, and obviously Texas is in, and Texas Tech is out in, in the Southwest Conference. One team out of there. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, Texas Tech was obviously a, a, a nice team and uh, played overtime in the conference championship yesterday against the University of Texas, but they were 1-5 and five, uh, versus the top 150, and they were 5-3 and three versus 51 through 50. They were a team that was was very close, a team we gave a lot of consideration to. Uh, but again, in our opinion, we just didn't feel like they were one of the uh, best 35 teams. Bob, uh, question I have, and go, let's go back to the Kansas situation and this confab you had with UNCM. And, uh, this, mm -hmm. Today we had a very unusual situation. The ACC, the SEC, and the Big East right. with six of the top ten teams in the country going head-to-head. -head. It seems right. to be rather obvious that after the ACC tournament, Wake Forest moved ahead of North Carolina. The same thing in the SEC where Kentucky moved ahead of Arkansas. It would seem to me that those would have flipped if those teams had won. And yet Kansas, which loses in the semifinals, retains a number one position. At what point in your deliberations did the postseason tournaments not mean anything? Well, I think uh, the, the committee, when Jake was with them, talked about the situation. Uh, we actually had five different scenarios, Billy, that, of things happening today uh, that would determine the top seeds. And uh, you're right about uh, North Carolina and Wake Forest. As you recall, there was a four-way tie for the championship in the ACC. The four teams got to the semifinals, played to the championship, and Wake wins in overtime, which was their second win against North Carolina. And so we went with uh, Wake for the number one seed. We also had another scenario that involved uh, Arkansas and Kentucky and Kansas. But we had five different scenarios today that were all waiting until almost 4 o'clock to be determined. All right, Bob. Hey, Bob, real quick, yes or no, was uh, Iowa going to get in if it won today against Indiana? Yes or no? Uh, I can't answer that because there were a cluster of teams that we considered at the end, Jim, and uh, we had to wait until all the games okay. were in and consider that game like all the others. All right, Bob. I know this was the hardest year ever for the committee. Had to be so much coming down yeah. to the weekend. Thanks but for I'm your really time. Bob, thank you. And uh, Andrea Joyce there in Kansas City, thank you, too. We'll come back and uh, go around the brackets, break them down, we will, with the panel of experts as we continue right here on CBS in just a moment. And uh, let's start out in Baltimore in East Action. The eight sites, we begin with Baltimore. This is a, a Thursday, Saturday site. Uh, Billy, there's your alma mater, Wake with a one seat. You now, told me you're going of, here. Not because of Wake Forest, but I'll tell you what, Minnesota, St. Louis, Alabama, Penn, those are regional final type games. I, I vote to go there. You've already made your own assignment. <laughs> you made your own assignment. All right, for all Listen, the guys in the ticket. back, Packers going to Baltimore, all right? So. George, what about this, this bracket when you take a look at it? I'm going to tell you this. If I were Alabama, I wouldn't feel comfortable about that draw at all, boy. How about Penn at number 12 and played so well last year in the NCAA tournament? Big yeah. country down there against Drexel in a first-round game. Also in the east in Albany, take a look at that one. Tulsa's there along with Illinois. Villanova, which looks so good today in the, in the big east. Anything uh, catch your eye there, Quinn? Well, the Villanova Tulsa, but I just I, what I really like is Villanova's shot right here. I, I like the way they they've got to get a chance to get into the regions. How about you, Mass Billy? You know that's the that's the team jumps out. You know they, they were overcome with all the media attention to the major conferences to, uh, this weekend. Massachusetts sitting back there. I think they're going to be ready to go. And they'll have some kind of crowd there in Albany, won't question. they, George? I think the sleeper team in that bracket right there is Stanford. 
I, 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 it, they're going to be most difficult to Come defense. Come on, George. That's the Pac-10. Uh, that's the Pac-10 conversation. <laughs> like a Pac-10 guy. We here, you were doing this all weekend. <laughs> hey, we, you go out and defense. Villanova's <laughs> there. They're the sleeper. You, That's your alma mater. Well, let's you go west. Let's, let's go west. Night. Let's go west just for George right now. This is Salt Lake City <laughs> and uh, Texas, uh, a sleeper team that Coach Raveling and I agree on. Uh, Texas against Oregon, then Maryland against Gonzaga, and UConn goes west. Billy, as we were talking about all weekend. Yeah, we, we were, but Cincinnati Temple, how about that? Bobby Huggins has won every great Midwest championship there's been. That will be a defensive sp uh, struggle right there, seven against ten. And also in the west on Friday in Boise, UCLA uh, uh, against Florida International. And the next game, Quinn, is coming to you now. Missouri-Indiana <laughs> winner against UCLA in round two. Well, in round two, you got a life. You know, as a matter of fact, I recall it, Coach Knight's second year in the league, uh, in his start coaching year, in the final four, he played against UCLA. So that, that'll be a good matchup. FYI, I don't mean to kill off FIU quite yet, but they've got to play UCLA in the first round. They do. And, and for Jim Herrick's team, and George, you, you can appreciate this more than any of us here, and the fact that getting over that hump of the first game, no 16 has ever beat a one. UCLA will have to concentrate, but it's great to get that game under your belt. The real temptation there, Billy, is not to look past that game, though. Oh, I understand that. All right, Kansas gets the one seed in the Midwest, and uh, Colgate in the first game, Donald Foyle awaits, and then Western Kentucky, Michigan, the winner of that game, uh, moving on possibly against the Jayhawks round two. Jim, the thing that jumps out at you right there is the situation at Arizona. I mean, you have to get that rectified. No coach can go ahead and make an adjustment in one week to go ahead and take a, what has been an outstanding program and team if they have to go ahead and, and change the way they play. How about uh, so Virginia? That'd be interesting. How about Virginia, guys? Excellent basketball team. I, I like Virginia. I tell you what I like about them now. With Corey Alexander gone, then without deference to him, they're playing better. They, they're playing more like a team. Also in the Midwest, this is the uh, Friday-Sunday combination. Memphis against Louisville, which won the Metro today. Purdue, Billy, you've talked about how tough they are. Syracuse, and there's Arkansas will play the winner of the SWAC, uh, which will be determined here in just a little Boy, while. It's almost like going back <laughs> to the old days of the Metro. Memphis against Louisville. Those used to be some of the greatest battles of all time. How about the bracket for Arkansas, George? You had some thoughts on that. I, I personally think that Arkansas has to feel really good about the bracket that they're in, at least till the final eight anyway. Okay, moving on now to the southeast. Kentucky, the one seed in the southeast. And uh, they'll be going to Memphis, Oklahoma, down at the bottom side of that bracket against Manhattan. What about Manhattan getting into the tournament, Billy? I, I don't like it at all. I, real, I, I didn't like the answer. I like Mike Jarvis's answer. I mean, it was incredible that a coach first could have class that one. The first class answer. answer. I mean, the dignity that he showed in his answer is incredible. But there is no way you can knock them out. They, they beat teams that, that are seeded basketball teams. They beat Massachusetts. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what they did. And plus, Jimmy, in the last two years, they made it to the Sweet 16 two years ago. Last year, they made a very good showing in the NCAA tournament. I think that they really belong to be in there. George, we saw Arizona's a five in one bracket. Arizona State's also a five. How about those two schools in the tournament? I like Arizona State a lot because of style of play. They put a lot of pressure on you. They trap you all over the court. They're an outstanding three-point shooting team. And Mario Bennett, they have one of the best shot blockers in the country. Jimmy, I, if they can I, end the season the way they started it, winning in Hawaii, I think that would be a pretty good <laughs> end for Bill Frieder. I think the Southeast is the toughest of the four, and here's a good reason why. Look at this page right here. Georgetown, Michigan State, Florida in the Final Four last year, Iowa State which beat Kansas this week, and North okay. Carolina. How about it, Quinn? Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. I think Georgetown is going to be a team that's really going to give some people problems there because they got a lot of big people they can run after, and their pressure can give you problems as well. Think about that. North Carolina and Kentucky in the same bracket in the southeast, George. Holy God, a coach's dream and a fan's dream. Well, how about the champions you've got there? You've got Kentucky and North Carolina, Michigan State, right up to the last day with, with – uh, uh, Purdue, Purdue for a championship, uh, Georgetown, we know coming on strong. I agree, Jimmy. I think it's the toughest region. Okay, guys, that's a look at it one more time. It all gets started on Thursday. We can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right now, let's set it back over to Pat O'Brien. Pat? Jim, thank you. The nine-man selection committee has done its job, and now it's time.
And hi again, everybody. Jim Nance along with Special K, Clark Kellogg. Welcome to night two on the road to the final four. CBS Sports exclusive continuing coverage of the NCAA basketball tournament. It has been a St. Patrick's Day parade of close games in the afternoon. Yeah, you need to make your free throws and execute down the stretch. Otherwise, you're out of here. Arkansas, North Carolina, and UMass all had tight ones during the day. Tonight, another first round doubleheader. Most of you are going to see Indiana against Missouri, a classic 8-9 matchup in the West. Then, in a today in the West region, first round. This afternoon, we saw two teams advance tonight, Indiana and Missouri, perhaps the best matchup in the entire first round. This afternoon, Utah defeated Long Beach State, and Mississippi State, the number five seed, defeated Santa Clara to move in against Utah in the second round. Following Missouri-Indiana, it'll be UCLA and Florida International. And believe it or not, this will be the first matchup between this man, Bob Knight, the coach of the Indiana Hoosiers, and Norm Stewart, the coach of the Missouri Tigers. 28 years for Stewart, 24 years at Indiana for Knight, 659 wins each, and yet they have never met. Well, I, I, I tell you what, they're both uh, champs in our profession. Everyone uh, respects them. I think that Coach Knight has his team in the right swing now. I think that he's more or less than hammering them. He's kind of patting the fannies of the freshmen. And if they're going to win today, it's going to be the freshmen they are going to win for them. Well, this Indiana team has got a spectacular player by the name of Alan Henderson, and I think uh, this is a guy who every night, because they're such a young team, is a key player for them. Well, Alan, what he does after that injury last year, he was well, but he still had the scar on his head. Now he's completely well, and he's going to end up just about every game guaranteeing you about 20 points and 11-12 rebounds. 23.7 he brings into this game as the scoring leader for Indiana. Paul Olenny is the scoring leader for the Missouri Tigers, and he's more more than just a score. He must score more than his average. He, he'll dish and he'll go for the ball. He can tell with a bandage on his nose. He's uh, he just puts his body out there every time he plays. But he has to have a huge offensive game for the Tigers to win. Julian Winfield, another key player for the Tigers, kind of a do-it-all guy for them and a great defensive player. Two uh, changes in the starting lineup for the Hoosiers at guard. Steve Hart and Neil Reed, we expect, will be in Charlie Miller's uh, spot. For more on the changes and the reasons why, let's go to our reporter, Michelle Tafoya. All right, guys. Well, Steve Hart will be starting in place of Michael Herman, partly because Michael Herman hasn't been feeling that well, also because Hart has been playing very, very well in practice this week, and they think he is the best defensive stopper to play against uh, Paul Olini this afternoon. Gentlemen. Thanks, Michelle, and it is Neil Reed also in the lineup at guard, and he's playing with a sore shoulder in which he wears a football pad to protect it from the season, uh, er, an earlier injury in the season. And Missouri in white. The Hoosiers in red were just underway. Winfield in traffic in the lane, and we got a jump ball. The arrow is in favor of the Tigers. Officials tonight, John Claggerty, Carl Hess, and Michael Kitts, appropriate a guy named Claggerty as one of the officials on a March 17th date. Well, Haley that time should have bounced that ball into Winfield. Winfield had perfect position. Ooh, Alini, they... and he missed it from underneath. Taken away by Henderson. Henderson, six foot nine. Minneapolis, Indiana. Henderson wants, I mean, excuse me, Henderson, I, you want to start a ball movement, back screen, side screens, constantly screening. Henderson missing on his first attempt of the ball game. That is Sutherland, Sutherland off the front iron. Rebounded by the Tigers, Grimm. And Winfield will organize things for Mizzou. One of the big problems with Mizzou is that they go on extended droughts during ball games. They're a physical ball club, but they go on these four or five minute uh, spurts if they don't score a point. Winfield in and out. Battle for the rebound, and Sutherland comes away with it. Lenny, Winfield, Sutherland starts it over again. Derek Grimm. They're kind of letting Winfield roam wherever he wants. Sutherland with that tape right elbow. He claims that it's 100%, but nobody quite believes that. Grimm from town kind of gingerly on his foot that time. He did. Derek Grimm, the sophomore from Morton, Illinois. Good three-point shooter at 45%. They'll need his 
action scoring as well. And neither team able to find a bucket jet here, each with two tries. Henderson had two good looks, just didn't drain them. He will. <laughs> That's Brian Evans, a junior from Terre Haute, Indiana. That's a man you got to stay up on. Hoosiers consider him their best pure shooter. And he's coming off a shoulder injury. That's a Lenny. We're tied at two. Well, I think Norm Stewart feels good because he told me yesterday that he dreamt that his team wouldn't score for the whole 40 minutes. We're tied at three with those pair of three-pointers, and now that's Reed driving for a 5-3 Indiana lead. Lenny in traffic. Travel called. Yeah, he took two small steps and one large one. Neil Reed, a freshman from Metairie, Louisiana. And a foul call. First of the game. Goes to Sutherland. Sutherland with an elbow 